love change. Okay, so keep it up, lazy, lazy. Okay, now uh, keep that hand up if you are loving change, even when it's completely and utterly imposed upon you. You get zero say in what it looks like. Absolutely. And I guess this is the space we all, some people still do, not many. Um, this is the space we tend to operate in, that um, you know, we get pretty comfortable with the way things are. And the reason for that is we're wired for this stuff. We crave routine. Uh, the last time uh, man could know everything was in 600 AD. And because we've entered the information era, there's too much information. So mostly, the more repeated a task is, we go on to those, you know, those little subconscious routines. You know that thing where you're driving down the road and you can't remember the last half an hour or so? You know that feeling? <laughs> Doesn't happen on a road you haven't driven down before. Okay, but the more common activities become, the harder it is for us to see how things could be done differently. So whether it be within your organisation or within your communities, it's incredibly difficult to shift people, which is why they just need to shift themselves. Change happens one individual at a time, as you all know. Okay, so what I want to do is talk a little bit about um, my take on change and innovation. Um, I spend a lot of time working uh, with corporates, with not-for-profits, and also in community um, because I'm kind of passionate about it. I see the lovely Sam Campy over here. Wave for Sam. Um, Sam is the community uh, engagement manager for uh, my local council in Northern Victoria. Um, so I'm a country girl, pretty passionate about getting out into those communities and having a great time, uh, except sometimes when we get out into those communities, um, we get a bit of this. Get a bit of that? bit of that love, or oh, she's here, whatever that is. Um, and the challenge is that you know, we get sort of caught up in old thinking. So what I want to do is talk about what I see from an innovation perspective. So this is the first innovation, okay? It was pretty cool, created by a Paleolithic man many years ago, or discovered. And what they realised was that rock was pretty cool. You could use it to build shelter. You could use it to um, kill your dinner. You could use it to defend yourself against others. Uh, so, you know, we were pretty much in love with rock for quite some time until somebody came up with an idea and it looked a little something like this. Rock 2.0. Imagine if we just put a stick on it, tie it around, and all of a sudden what we could do with rock exponentially went crazy. Okay, so now we can throw it further, we can hit it harder. It's extraordinary. What sort of time difference do you think it was between rock and rock 2.0? What do you think? 2,000 years. 2,000 years? Any bids, any higher bids on 2,000 years? Would you be surprised if I told you it looked a little something like this? Two million years. And if you're wondering why, you know, how many of you work in organisations that have got more than 20 people? We know why this happens. This happens because, okay, so somebody's in there and they're thinking, you know, somebody says, what if we add a stick to it? Well, have we done uh, the proper due diligence on the occupational health and safety uh, risks associated with Rock 2.0? Um, what will the community think? Um, I'm sure the boss won't go for that. Um, oh, I don't think we put the budget for this uh, when we struck it last year. You can see the conversations. This goes on and on and on. And it's not because um, people are hateful. It's just because new ideas are kind of challenging. And you know, even though we might complain about the current way, it's still pretty comfortable because of the way that brain works. You know, they've done experiments where you'll just get to see my extreme muscles here. Farm girl. Okay. Oh, it's light. Okay where they'll put a chair in the middle of a really busy thoroughfare just to irritate people, the only reason. And busy people are running off to their meetings and they'll go around the chair. What a ridiculous place to leave a chair. Somebody should move that. I'm busy. And so around the chair we go until all of a sudden we become very efficient and effective at walking around the chair. Have you seen this? Yeah, again and again. Until a fresh person comes in and says, what a stupid place to leave a chair and they move it, what do we do when we walk down the corridor? 
We still walk around it because that's the way we do things around here. And all of a sudden, you know, that change is much, much harder. So this is kind of the challenge, dealing with it within your organisations as woke people and dealing with it within your communities, incredibly hard. Um, the challenge is, how do you unlock it? And I think there's some pretty easy ways, but I, I think sometimes we're hard on people when it comes to where their brains are at. Because, you know what, I think we started in the 90s, this one. Think outside the square. Do you remember this? Many of you are too young to remember this. How did people feel at that whole think outside the square thing? You were never in the square? Well, I'm so pleased for you. Okay, because chances are if you're working in an organisation, there's a square. It's just about how big it is. And so people are told, come on guys, think differently. And you're engaging with these people in your organisations and we're told, come on, it's all about big, new, fresh ideas. Uh, but guess what? We've got responsibility for budget. So if you're worried about funding, how much something's going to cost or where we're going to get the money from, will you, do you think your ideas will be bigger or smaller? They're going to be smaller, absolutely, and it doesn't end there. Then it's this. Imagine if you... Oh, sorry if you... Imagine if you came up with the next big idea that could potentially trash the reputation of your organisation. Is that going to be a career-enhancing move or a career-limiting move? Yeah? All of a sudden, the risks are smaller, the ideas are smaller, and you know what? We just run harder and faster. Then there's this stuff, the bureaucracy. Okay? What does that do for your thinking? Um, are any of you into control? Like a bit of control? Wow. Five people into control, everybody else into denial. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> we love control. Come on, we want to do things well. We want it to work beautifully. What happens when two people who like control meet each other in a process? Is it love and harmony? No, it's kind of difficult. And that's why we create process. No, 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 this is how we do it. This is the corporate policy. This is the way things sit. And all of a sudden, those things, those bureauc bureaucratic processes become the thing that really repress us. Um, I did a, a MC a conference for, you'll be jealous of me here, local government governance specialists <laughs> about five years ago. And they were senior people and they brought really extraordinary speakers out from all over the world to challenge the status quo. And there was some great thinking. But I promise you, after every session, when somebody stood up to ask the question, they would say their version of, but we can't do that because it's not in the act. Or we have to do this because it's in the act. And I'm thinking, what's the act? Nobody's told me about the act. Apparently there's a local government act. And it's the Bible for everything. Until halfway through the second day, someone stood up and said, I cannot take it another minute. Do you know, I was involved in writing the original Act and many of the amendments since then. And most of what you think is in the Act is not. And most of what you think isn't in the Act is. But the Act has been used as this device to squish thinking for the longest, longest time. So now it's shorthand, it's gorgeous. You never have to say, well, you know, what kind of engagement have you done on this? Um, who's on board? You never have to have these kind of conversations. All you have to do is say, it's not in the Act. Bang. Ideas are killed left, right and centre. You know, it's efficient. I have to say, but probably we're not going to get the change we need. Okay, so there's that stuff. And then this stuff, the tradition, the habitual stuff, the stuff that we don't even notice that we do. So how many of you get up, apart from, I know we're here for a couple of days, how many of you get up at the same time every day? Have the same brekkie? Same coffee, same whatever, drive to work the same way? Yeah, yeah. How present do you think you are for that stuff? Yeah, chances are you only wake up when something goes wrong. Okay, um, which hopefully is not too often, but I, would, I hope we can um, wake a little more. Marion said she has her best ideas in when she's washing her hair or driving the car. Okay, why would that be the place where you have your best ideas? So she's trapped, she can't do anything else, she's a multitasker. But apart from that, what stress is there when you're washing your hair? What position is your brain in? Okay, you're relaxed.
There you go. Oh, an hour trip to work seen as a positive by somebody. I love it. Okay, um, what route do you take? Let us all know if you're not present. We won't take that road on the way to work. <laughs> Oh, it sounds beautiful. Stop. Let me talk to you about the Monash Freeway in Melbourne. Oh, okay. I don't think any ideas happen there. Well, this is nice, but creating that space to be able to come up with ideas is incredibly important because many people in their workspace are oppressed by this. So when somebody says, it's time to think differently, this is how they feel constrained, restricted, and you know what? And then that means we try little stuff. And then we think, yeah, 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 we're innovating. We're doing the little things. Well, the little things aren't going to make much change. The little things assume the system works. Okay, sometimes we just need to blow the system up and start all over again, which is kind of my favourite thing. But to do that, we need to be able to reset the thinking. So I want to take you all back a few years to grade three. Okay, and I apologise if anybody has a little bit of maths anxiety, uh, residual maths anxiety from their education experience. This is a little uh, bit of maths homework that we all got around about grade three. Looks like this. Cut the cake four times. How many pieces would you get? What's the answer? Depends where you cut. It does, but remember it's grade three maths. <laughs> and you say it depends where you cut to the teacher. What does the teacher say? <laughs> if you repeatedly say that, um, well, the teacher's only going to make two assumptions, aren't they? You've got to sit outside the principal's office or a special education intervention. Okay. <laughs> when the fact is, you are absolutely right. We are born with all this extraordinary creative potential, potential but we're taught this is the way we do things around here. Um, my mum's a kinder teacher and she used to sing this song to us, This Is The Way. Do you remember that song? This is the way we tie our shoes, tie our shoes. I'm not going to sing because I've been asked not to. Okay. Um, but This Is The Way is about teaching us that there is one right way for everything. And if we don't talk about it, that stuff is caught in our heads. We're not even realising some of the assumptions, some of the things that we assume just can't be done. So, yeah, the answer they're looking for is eight, but you're spot on. It's not the only answer. So I would love you to work. You've got pens and paper at your tables. I'm going to give you a little thinking activity. If you were to cut the cake four times, I want to know how many pieces you could get. So least number of pieces, most number of pieces. You have got three minutes. Go crazy. <laughs> okay, time's up. Okay, so I just want to capture a couple of those thoughts on the whiteboard. I apologise if you can't see it well. What's the least number of pieces you came up with? One. One. How did you get one? So a little something like this. Is that how you guys got to zero? We said you can't touch the bottom because you have to kiss the nearest person. Okay. I always love it when hygiene's introduced to a maths <laughs> argument. Okay. So they're not cutting through. In fact, I've seen maths teachers come to fisticuffs over whether that's zero or one. Because it's still a hole. It's not a piece. Okay. Um, is this cheating? Yeah, yeah. you might go to the principal for this one. It's not cheating, but what it does is it challenges a fundamental assumption, which is you have to cut all the way through, yeah? So that's an assumption. Now, some of you might have started drawing lines in the same space, which breaks another assumption. You might have put your four in the centre to get two pieces. I'd love to know what the most number of pieces you got were. 12? Can anyone beat 12? 14? 20? 16? Okay, so in order to get to that, you had to break a few more assumptions. Did anybody add 
a third dimension to their cake. You thinkers, well done. Okay, did anybody, I, I, I did hear a little bit of defending ideas during that thing. Somebody would say, what about this? No, breaking the rules. <laughs> okay, did anybody challenge that most fundamental of assumptions that it has to be straight lines? Yes. Well done. So, in fact, <laughs> how many pieces do you want? Around and around and around. Now, some of you might be having the quality argument. Who wants to eat that cake? <laughs> no one said you were getting to eat that cake. The thing is that these ideas are all valid. And by the way, that's the straight lines. What did you assume you were cutting with? Knife. Standard knife, multi-bladed device, combine harvester, fly screen. <laughs> the answer is <laughs> messy but effective. The thing is that uh, very often we're working with people who, when you ask them to think differently, think eight. Because, you know what, we're, every, we're rewarded for action. Everything drives us towards that one perfect answer, which automatically thinks it's harder. Now, you're working with people... That's seven cuts. That... Okay. Okay. Let's go with it. Okay, so <laughs> however many you like, the challenge is, doesn't it make more sense to come up with all of the options, as many options as you can, and then select the one that's most fit? But we tend not to do that. We're trained for the obvious. So the challenge from my perspective is, when you get a little, you're working with a group, on a challenge is to be able to say, what is it telling us we have to do? What is it telling us we're not allowed to? Because everything else should be up for grabs. The problem is most of this stuff is in people's heads and it's never even articulated. So shouldn't that be the first conversation? What are we assuming yeah. about this thing? Let's get it down on the table. Let's challenge it. By the way, it's gonna eliminate half the arguments that we have along the way that will be about killing ideas because we've already said, no, 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 we can work in that space or challenge, or at least we've taken the temperature for where people's thinking is at, which I think is incredibly powerful. Okay, so could you do this thinking all day long? It's only some of us. So this is kind of the challenge. You know, you go away for the big retreat, you get your group together. I guess this is what community engagement used to look like, or at least community planning. So, you know, somebody would walk in the room and they'd have a 500 year plan. Yeah, do you know those people? <gasps> Imagine if, actually I do know a teacher who had a 500 year plan and her policy was that if she didn't get started now, it would never be delivered. Okay, um, and funnily enough, consecutive four year plans just are not gonna create that transformation. So what would we say when somebody walks into the room, sits down at the table and they've got a big fabulous plan? What will we say? Is it welcome visionary one, at last you are here, you will help us transform the world and lead us into the future? Does it look like that or a little bit more like this? How much is that gonna cost? When can we deliver that by? So this will go on until you know we're three quarters through the meeting and someone's like, oh gosh, can we just make something happen? Can we just deliver something? By which stage we're probably pretty irritated with each other and the bridge builders come in. Come on guys, let's find a way, we'll work together. Okay, the challenge is, <laughs> These are all really important conversations, um, but what tends to happen is this, we do it all at the same time. And unless we're very careful, we end up with nothing um, other than heightened irritation uh, for each other. The challenge is to be able to say, well, how would we sequ sequence those conversations so that we can create that change? So that the follow-up to, I've got a 500 year plan is not how much will it cost, but in fact, what could it look like? an entirely different conversation, one that's about inquiry, not shutting it down, not evaluation. When I think we're very often, I know I understand evaluation's important, but it can always be done a little bit later. You can't work out what something's gonna look like a little bit later. That's our challenge. Okay, 
I'll just wait for Marion to get this shot. Beautiful. Okay, so if this is the amount of time you've got to create that, um, what we tend to see when people are thinking about the future is this divergent conversation, known as the joyous explosion of ideas. Okay, this was, I think, community planning version 1.0. Go and talk to people, see what they want, get them excited, they've got a wish list. I think this is like the, it's early this century, I think. What happened with that? We raised expectations. What happened then? We didn't meet those expectations. What happened then? We pissed off our community. I love it. Then we get our act together. We're actually a lot better at it and we go into work with that same community. How excited are they to see us? <laughs> Not very is the answer, isn't it? They're like, hang on. I'm going to spend three months or however much of my life in this process and we got nothing last time and you led me to believe we should have everything. It's kind of extraordinary and the reason this happens is you know what we're very good at this and even in your organisational retreats do any of you go away for the you know a couple of days it says something that it can't be done at the office by the way go away for a couple of days have your 10,000 ideas capture it on the butcher's paper roll it up sacred scroll leading us into the future <laughs> take it back to work what happens with it? It stays rolled up. Somebody's been given responsibility to decode it. Um, eventually, uh, we just give up the will to live. Until <laughs> next year at the retreat, somebody says, what if we did this? We're like, gee, that feels like a familiar idea. Could we have had it last year and the year before and the year before? And the reason for this is what happens when you get back to work? Yeah. Does it look a little something like this? You know? What's happened in the real world? You guys are spending two days here together. Is that extraordinary for you? Will you love it? What happens when you get back to work? <laughs> this? Yeah, okay. Which might means you need to be incredibly careful about how you connect those ideas with what you can actually deliver. So what we tend to have, we are born hardwired for ideas. So that imagine thing, that creativity thing, everyone's creative. It just, it depends on the kind of life they've led, how constrained they've been by rules that have been imposed upon them. Because it's, you know, it's your parents, you know, that's hot, don't touch it. At school, you know, the straight lines, it's secondary school, it's university, it's your first job, your second job, this is the way we do things around here, this is the way we do things around here. And all of a sudden, there's a mountain of our creativity that we never, ever tap into. Uh, luckily, though, because we are hardwired for it, it's just a matter of a little bit of cerebral re rehabilitation. Okay, let people spend some time having ideas. Just having ideas, not worrying about how much they're going to cost, when they can be delivered by. Just have a little bit of fun with it and it's extraordinary what you can create. We're also hardwired for action, making stuff happen. The challenge is how do you connect ideas and action? The thinking in the middle is challenging, it is learnt and I think very often that's the space that organisations tend to occupy. That's the space that I think maybe local government kind of occupies. But what happens if you're a community who knows how to have ideas, who knows how to make stuff happen, and you have no visibility of the stuff that goes on in the middle? What happens? The stuff you get is not necessarily fit for purpose because it doesn't look like what you were dreaming about originally. Um, you have missed the opportunity, you know, because this thinking in here, this is your opportunity to get your DNA all over that thing. This is just a thought bite. This is your opportunity to get authorship of the work you've been doing. And if community doesn't get involved here, if the people in your organisations don't get involved here, they're not going to feel those ideas in the same way. So the challenge is how do we connect those ideas? Okay, so it's about letting our ideas get big enough that they can transform and then bring them into land. So this is just a really cool little simple way of thinking about how you would get from that first point to the second point. Conversation one, <laughs> why not this, why not that? It could be anything. Let's collect as many ideas as we can get our hands on. Conversation two, what would that look like? Not how much would that cost? You know, can we deliver it by Tuesday? What could that look like? developing options. So if this is 10,000 ideas, you know, maybe this is half, half a dozen well thought out schemes 
for how we can achieve that original dream. Um, then decisions, only then decisions, and then move to action. Does the conversation, does the flow of conversations make sense? Yeah? Have an idea, work out what it will look like, decide whether to proceed or not, and then go to action. This is the challenge, you know, we tend to get good in some spaces and not in others. Um, I call this, no offence, the local government sausage factory. Okay, which is where it looks like a cow here. Okay, it looks like this strange sausage thing here. What on earth has happened to it to make it look like this in the end? Um, and that's kind of, I think, what, where we miss out on quite a bit of engagement. You know, you will have it, that room where we were saying 500 year plan, all of that stuff. Any room is going to have people who've developed thinking preferences over their time. Anyone with, you're engaging with, there will be people who love having ideas. 10,000 of. By the way, who, who would, if that was your job and you just had to have ideas all day long, who would go for that? Yeah? Cool. Okay. Who gets to do that all day long? No one. Okay. Um, the development conversation is a little bit, it's a little bit more like the architect interpreting those ideas. This is what it could look like in those options. Who loves that kind of a conversation? Yeah? Different crowd? Some people the same? What about evaluation? Who loves their decision making? They're like ninjas for it. One hand, two hands, everyone else. Oh, please, could somebody else do that for me? And action, who likes making stuff happen? Okay, and this is because that and that is the high octane space. It's full of passion and exciting. There's a big payoff here because it was fun and it made me feel good. There's a big payoff down there because it's a lovely space. The stuff in the middle is kind of challenging. Because development, have, you've got to be able to interpret that idea. So you've got to be creative enough that you can see what could come out of it, while at the same time turning it into something that a decision can be made about. Difficult thinking, uh, but it can be done. Um, so I'll briefly tell you a quick little story about my parents, dairy farmers in northern Victoria, OK? So my mum's all in this space, big on ideas, Fabulous. My dad was all down in this space, okay, making stuff happen. How do you think they got along? What do you reckon? <laughs> Carefully until he realised she was in charge and then it was beautiful. No, no. Um, rocky at the start, but eventually they got their groove on and they realised that when they thought together, they could achieve extraordinary things. Like, who do ideas people want to hang out with? Other ideas people. Why? It's fun, it feels like nice. We don't want to hang out with them. They're anal retentive, they have no vision. By the way, what do ideas people accomplish if they just hang out by themselves? Nothing. Nothing. Although it does feel nice. Okay. <laughs> who do the, I, I always love this, who do the action people have morning tea with? You would think other action people know they're too busy for morning tea. Okay. <laughs> but if they had it, they would hang out with each other. And what would they achieve? Everything that was important yesterday and nothing that we need tomorrow, which is kind of the challenge. So Jan and Gary Smith, the way they were connected was kind of interesting. So if mum had walked into the house and said, Gary, let's increase the herd by 500 head, what would he have said? Oh, he would have killed that. He would have thought about the fences. He would have thought about who's going to milk those cows? Who's going to grow the grass to feed those cows? Who's going to, who's going to? And he would have canned that idea, which is why she never would have done that. What she would do is a little bit of, what will we call, feminine thinking. Okay, so she'd just go for a drive around the farm with Dad and let him know how beautiful it looked. Look how much pasture there is, Gary. It's magnificent. I've never seen the farm look so good. And then he'd come in for his morning, morning cuppa and the stock and land would be open at the cattle prices. Ooh, gee, the, the price is reasonable at the moment, Chad. Oh. And then they'd walk down the one street in my town, Gagari, and they'd uh, accidentally run into someone looking for some relief milkings. Until finally my dad would walk in the house and say, Janice, I've had a brilliant idea. <laughs> okay. So, was my dad an idiot? No, well said. Uh, he's a man of action. Um, is my mum a manipulator? Well, she is, but not in this case, because if the grass wasn't long, if the price of cattle was too high, 
If there was no one to do relief milkings, he's not going for it. What she does is she, she gives him the parameters to help him turn it from a thought bite into something he can actually get his head around. And I think that's the conversation we struggle in. So what we tend to do is jump from idea, oh, that sounds like a good one, making a decision and going to action. And you know, I don't often quote the Pentagon, but for their organisation, they've done some work, and for every dollar they don't spend here, it costs them 16 here. Wow. Think about it. There's no concrete poured here. You can test it. You can get out into community. You can talk to them. You can put something in front of them that they can start adjusting uh, before a final decision's made so they can get their heads around it. That's the power. If community can get involved in this space, that saves much of the engagement work that happens down here because there's plenty of organisations that still think once a decision's made, that's when you engage and they want the ta-da moment absolutely going to set yourselves up. Um, and we've got projects throughout this country where people have rushed through this conversation and moved it all down here, cost reputation, really set themselves up to lose a whole lot of credibility, okay, because you get one chance to make a first impression, okay, and if not, you're going to have to do a whole lot of social resuscitation uh, to get back, in, back into people's great thinking. Okay, so you work out where your thinking preference is. So think about the people in your organisations. How do they connect up with each other as thinkers? They don't, do they? It's skill, it's hierarchy, it's the department. Um, I heard somebody um, last week, the City of Melbourne have got this cool analytics guy and he does all this stuff and he can, it's extraordinary, he can plot where it's best to put things. Okay, so it's very technical, but the one question that people kept asking at the end of his presentation was, yeah, what department have they put you in? <laughs> uh, and the answer was, well, we were in community and, but not enough people were utilising us, so they've moved us to the tech team now and then they're going to move us here, and they're going to move us there. I mean, in our heads, somehow, we must think that a formal structure is the reason that we're not connecting, which is why... By the way, how many of your organisations have had a restructure in the last five years? <laughs> Four, three, two, again and again, yeah? We do this over and over again, thinking that's going to unlock what we're missing. Uh, but there's some flawed assumptions with that, okay? For me, I think hierarchy goes this way. Where are we in our process? What's the thinking that best works for us? And spend enough time there, you know? And it's not like you need to spend a thousand years. If you spend time in the imagined space, maybe even of your project 10%, then it's kind of extraordinary what you can cover off. But we tend to sort of rush that or trot out last year's answers or get caught in this space that I think is incredibly unhelpful. And of course, we're also very emotionally attached. Um, in the little shire of Camp Aspey, uh, a number of years ago, we got all these little towns together to do some thinking about what was cool about their towns, thinking for the future. I gave them a bit of creative resuscitation. It was fabulous. The vibe was good. Then I said, OK, get in your little towns and do some thinking. What could you be? What could you have? And guess what happened? Nothing. Uh, because we're kind of emotionally attached to that thing. So what ended up happening was I said, OK, I'm going to gift you the town next door. So Gunbauer, I want you to think about what could be happening in Gagari. In Gagari, I want you to be thinking about what can happen in Kai Valley and so on and so on. And I swear, in a five-minute brainstorm, over 500 ideas, some of which were standard, some of which were totally freaky, but a whole lot of them which were really, really interesting. And we created an ideas bank um, out of those ideas. And in fact, a, a number of those ideas have been implemented. So why can't we have a big idea about the thing we're emotionally attached to? What's that all about? Change. Change. We care. The, the assumptions we make. All of those things. We view ourselves in one way. And so shifting that kind of thinking in a town is incredibly difficult. Um, 
no matter how wide your community is, the ability to be able to, you know, tap them in to what was cool. You know, my town nearly died. Um, when I was little, it had a population of 350 people and you'd walk down the street on a Saturday morning. It was very, very cool. Uh, everyone knew everyone, you said hello. It was great. Um, pan forward, I don't know, I'm not going to give my age away, a certain number of years and uh, our supermarket's gone, um, our milk factory's gone, although another factory's moved in, but, you know, they're not really... You know, nobody from the town's employed there. Um, our population's dropped to 120. There's basically no kids in the school, on and on and on. And the town's, you know, ready to die. Um, what do you do with a town like that? <coughs> Any ideas? Well, in the case of Gagari, it was a grant for 600 bucks from the Shire. Uh, and they put on a party. They were going to just go out with a bang. <laughs> Right? How cool. So they got a, they got a keg, they got a, um, a barbecue, the local football club, they dressed up in drag and put a show on. It was held at the you know, rural supply store. And people who came, in fact, who had, came, hadn't been engaged for the longest period of time was kind of extraordinary. And the conversation they started having, which was the most interesting to me, is, gee, it's great to catch up. And effectively they were saying, oh, we sort of lost the idea of what our identity was. So we were thinking this was a place where you came to do business and when there was no need to do business anymore, we stopped coming. But in fact, the reason this place was cool was because it's a great place to get together, to connect, to feel that vibe. So they had 300 bucks left because they're frugal partiers. <laughs> uh, who'd be surprised? And they brainstormed what they could do to uh, create difference and create that connection and they just decided to have a go. Um, a guy said, why don't we have a farmer's market? And the people said, what have we got to lose? Funnily enough, he was not from our town. He was from the town next door and he'd been saying, let's have a farmer's market for 10 years. And what were the people in that town saying? It'll never work, who'll come, we'll look like fools, all of that kind of stuff. You know, we're so risk averse after time. So now if I want to pan forward all these years later, Gagari's got the second biggest farmer's market in rural Victoria. Um, it has a music festival. It has monthly jamming sessions where community teach each other to play music instruments. I could go on and on and on and on. Um, Heinz announced they were leaving and bequeathed some land and some cash. They're building a, a $12 million botanic gardens in this tiny little town, which, by the way, has grown its population to nearly 200, has got more kids in the school, has changed, has changed, has changed. How have they done that? Oh, by the way, they did win also a regional arts Victoria Small Towns Transformation Grant for 350000 and invited international artists to come in and do music in the town. I mean, the story of transformation in that space is pretty cool. And the interesting thing is how they've done it, by just taking it a bite at a time, stepping through the process. And the interesting thing is there are so many people in our town volunteering. And they volunteer because we are, once we get them, we've made a decision not to suck the very marrow out of their bones, which is what happens in lots of towns. So we've got people who just like having ideas. Guess what we get them to do? Uh, just have ideas. We've got people who say, don't ever bring me to a meeting. I never, ever want to go to a meeting again. Guess what we do? They just set up the market. So people come in. Um, have any of, any of you ever heard an orchestra practice? Yeah? What does it sound like? It's horrendous. It sounds like cats fighting, okay? They're all doing their thing at the same time. There's no musicality to it whatsoever. But what happens when the conductor comes in and taps the baton? It's beautiful. Everybody knows when it's their time, and that's the power. And this is what the idea model is all about, orchestration of thinking. What stage are we in? What kind of thinking will be helpful? How do we get our people comfortable with that kind of thinking? You know, because the one thing that we know, like if you look at those old models like, you know, innovation adaption models and things like that, they'll talk about innovators, okay? This is their kind of play space. Early adopters in this space as well. They just want the chance just to have ideas. You know, people who are a little bit behind, they love the development thing where we're starting to introduce evidence. 
and we're de-risking stuff. And probably all the way down here to your laggards, who will get on board, you know, when it's in the standard operating procedures. The challenge is that uh, a lot of places I see put a lot of effort into getting those innovators on board, getting them excited, which is a complete and utter waste of time, by the way, because they're excited by newness. They're coming anyway. And then a lot of effort down here, which is a complete and utter waste of time because they're not ready, not for a long, long time. The sweet spot will be people who are involved in this space. And so if your communities are excluded from the development space, it's going to be much, much harder for them to engage in what that thing is. And, you know, for, for us in our town anyway, I think we had a whole lot of people who were great in this space who hadn't engaged before until we got the, the, the gardens, which was a big project and something they could get their teeth into. They're engaged. So that's kind of the power. So what I want to just quickly talk about is what does that look like in an organisation. If you're thinking about those thinking, um, the favourite thinking spaces. This is probably the org chart of a typical organisation. Somebody who loves decisions right at the top, they're good at them, they're ninjas for it. And then all the layers. So where are the ideas going to come from in this organisation? Is it sort of going to come from down here? Why not at the top? Probably because it's harder for me at the top to have an idea. If I, my emails are going, I'm expected to evaluate the whole time. By the way, those ideas won't necessarily take consideration of ground truth. Okay, so this is the challenge. And by the way, even if the ideas come from the top, that's cool because there's nothing going to stop those ideas from getting through. They're at the top. So just say somebody down here has an idea. A great new idea for what it's going to look like in the future. Where will that idea go? How successful will it be? <laughs> right about oh, there, don't you reckon? Okay, because there's every level we go up, there's more command and control, there's more risk thinking. So that kind of structure is not going to work when it comes to sharing ideas. But in fact, it's the way most organisations are built. Here's a different take on it, though. There's this thing called the internet, okay? We think it's going to be big. Just watch out, watch out. And how do people connect on the internet? How do ideas get through on the internet? You just put it out there. There are people on the other... You, if you put a challenge up on the internet, there are people on the other side of the world just waiting for it, and they're going to do some thinking. You'll get up tomorrow morning. There'll be more thinking done. They know how to connect because there aren't any structures or processes standing in the way, okay? So I think this is a pretty interesting model which takes us to this, okay? So think about any major city. That's how we're structured. It's the way we're set up to work, okay? But you know what? It's hard to get anywhere. I've just got back from um, a lovely trip to Italy and, <laughs> sorry, uh, I've still got the glow. Uh, and the Google map thing is extraordinary, you know? I want to get from A to B, but I have my mum with me. She can't walk far. And so we're going to take a taxi cab. That taxi cab is going to um, take so much longer, so many more kilometres to get there because of the way the city is structured. It's faster to walk than to take a taxi anywhere in Rome. But that's how we're structured because, you know, we've got all these little one-way streets, we've got all this weird stuff happening. So how do people get around in those major cities? Think New York. It looks a little something like this. It's the subway. It's the way you get underground, get away from those roads and start connecting and getting to other places fast. And I think this is kind of a nice little metaphor for how we should be getting around in our organisations. Okay, so this is the way we're structured. We create these big tall buildings up above us. I'm the finance department. I'm the this department. I'm the that department. And how often do we play outside of those? Not as, it's harder than we would like it to be, let's just say. If you've got personal relationships, it's probably a little bit easier in some of those areas, but it's hard, which is why we keep restructuring, okay, to try and connect different groups. Because the problems don't happen in here or in here, they happen between there. Okay, so imagine if you had your own organisational underground, okay, which was where we understood who our thinkers were. Okay, we get where they are, what they know, what their skills are, and when there's a piece of work, and I need to actually grow 
across my organisation to get the minds I need. I take it out of those existing structures and I connect with people and we work in a different way, in an organic way, and then we lift it back up and go through the powers that be. Um, we've been doing this with CSL, you know, CSL, Commonwealth Serum Laboratories. It's like, you know, when you go and work with those people, it's very intimidating. You're the dumbest person in the room every time. You know, like, you know, two, three, four PhDs. I really can't have ideas. Can't have ideas. Can experiment, but can't have ideas. And this is the reason. When they operate up here, it's life and death. Life and death. Because every idea that they come up with, if it doesn't work, you know, they're going out to immunise people. They're in the, the immunisation business. They're in the medication business. They can't afford to make mistakes. But what's ended up happening, and this is the same for most organisations that operate in that space, is that those same rules that apply to a great new product development apply also to an engagement. Those same rules, because they're so overpowering, apply also to the stationary requisition. You know, everything is bound by this particular thing. And so we're working with them on, well, have an idea, and if it's not something that's a big, big risk, take it down and connect with people in different way. Because what we do know is that that structure up there is set up for world's best practice. Connecting minds in different ways is how you come up with next practice. And so the challenge for you guys, I think, is to be the organisational transformers. And I was, I was listening to you this morning. You're doing that. You're, you know, planting people with the skills in different areas, which I think is incredibly cool. What's even more interesting, I think, is, well, as interesting, is that there are people in organisations that we're trying to engage who love having ideas and never get to have one. There are people in organisations who are great in the development space, never get to do that. How engaged are they going to be? I mean, we only pay for the bodies to turn up. Remember that. Just the bodies. They walk in the door, they sit down. Okay. If you want more, if you want that discretionary effort, people need to be able to tap into all of their thinking potential, which is the development space and a whole lot of other things. Does this make sense? Yeah. So how many of you have got an underground in your workplace? Oh, you do. Fantastic. What does it look like? It's the people who bicycle to work. Luckily, a CEO involved in the bicyclers. You know, I used to, I'm embarrassed to say, smoke, and it was them back in the day. You know, you knew what was going on in your organisation because you went downstairs for a smoke. Uh, by the way, after I quit smoking, about three weeks later, I was made redundant. Didn't see it coming. <laughs> I was thinking, damn, I would have known if I'd still been smoking. So it's those, <laughs> it's those unofficial networks but you've got to have the right person riding a bike at that point in time. And what about all the people who aren't riding? How do we tap into them? Okay, because I, I actually don't think it matters. I can't think of an organisation that I have worked with who have not said silos are killing us. I cannot think of an organisation who've got caught in the space where they're starting to think, oh, you know, it's not about me. It's about my community, you know, that there are groups in there who are really struggling in this space. Um, we did a, a, a little planning uh, bit of work down in East Gippsland, which is um, a really socially disadvantaged, socioeconomically disadvantaged area. There's many, many challenges in there. It's the biggest shire um, with the fewest people, many, many challenges in that space. And we're doing this extraordinary planning process and most of the towns in that area are grieving. Um, Whatever it is they're grieving, they're in that space. So we're doing this very cool piece of work with them and we're starting to get them on board. They're yelling at us less. It's very cool. At the start of every session, I say, I'm not from the council. I'm, <laughs> from, I'm independent. And uh, just as we nearly got them there, another department sent out a note to the neighbourhood house. Oh, we want to involve you in our new strategy. And bang, all of our work was gone. Because, like, hang on, you said if we invested this time in creating our ideas of a plan for our future, we'd be able to move forward. By the way, as a result of that planning process, um, as they're spending a lot of money building a road with a nice little thing down the middle, what are the median strip down the middle, so that you could safely cross for visitors, because it's a pretty busy <laughs> little place, um, our surveying reveals that 25% of the people in the area have insufficient access to food. Bang. I wonder what we focus on. 
okay? Roads are pretty obvious. But what about our hungry people? What about people who've got insufficient access to employment or the right kind of employment? So some of those issues I think get missed when we work top down. What about bottom up? Gagari's success is because they've had ideas that they've been able to deliver on. Um, I, we get very caught in uh, thinking in old ways. And I just, I just wonder if the experts in the room shouldn't be the community. They know better. They have to live with it. What about, what are we doing to generate ideas in those spaces <laughs> and for them to be able to say, yeah, I see you're interested in that strategy. We don't think it's important. Shelve it. Which is, I think, a big challenge because there are people in organisations who are justifying their positions. Does that sound right? Yeah. Okay, so I'm looking busy. I'm doing great things. I know you need this. Well, maybe the community doesn't need it, doesn't want it, um, and I guess that's kind of the challenge. You know, I know in our towns and in the towns we've been working with, their fantasy is to partner with council throughout that process, for council to come in and advise along the way so they can make the, deliver their own projects. Um, sure, other projects, if they fit in with people's vision for the future, but it's got to start from that base level. Just like looking back at that org chart, the people at the lower levels of your organisation have ideas. They th see things that don't make sense. If there's a way for those ideas to funnel up, then I think it's incredibly powerful. Uh, and there's some really cool ways to do it. Um, we've done some road with Vic Roads. Yes, they, they are Vic Roads people here, aren't they? We did some work with them on creating an express lane. This is a good met metaphor for them. An express lane for ideas. Ideas that don't need to be thought of in that constrained way, that don't need 17 gates before, you know, it can even get to the light. What's that thinking in that space? Okay. Does it make sense to you guys? Yeah? Okay. I'd love you all to stand up if you wouldn't mind and select a partner. Don't worry. I'm not going to make you do any inappropriate touching. It's all right. Okay. All right, has everyone got a partner? Hands up if you haven't got a partner. Oh, a couple of threesomes is okay. Oh, they're switching here, this is very good. Okay, I want you to face your partner and check them out in a way that the HR department wouldn't be uncomfortable with. Okay, face them and check them out. Okay. Okay. Okay, everyone. Now I'd like you to turn back to back. Back to back. Back to back. This will a greater degree of difficulty in a group of three. Back to back. Look, it's a very low trust environment there, isn't it? Okay. And I would love you to change one thing about yourself. Oh, this feels easy. Mm. And once you've changed that thing, turn around and see if you can work out what's different. Okay. Okay, everyone. Okay, everyone. I will try to go. Okay, everyone. Did it work? Okay, in primary schools in Victoria, it's just that, do you know? Okay, so um, was that easy? Yeah? Okay, so how many of you have already put that thing back? But you said at the start you were change ready. Turn back to back again. Okay, now I'd like you to change six things about yourself. Oh, six. Six. And keep yourself nice. <laughs> oh.
Okay, once you've changed your six things, turn around and see if you can work out what's different. Yeah, we're, it, we're done, we're done. I'm all... Okay, everyone, take a seat. Okay, everyone, take a seat. Okay. Yeah, get dressed again, take your seat. Okay. So. Firstly, I'd like to thank you all for the fashion risks you just took. Very nice. So, changing one thing was easy, yeah? What sort of things did you change? Little things. Took my tag off, turned it round, mm -mm, whatever that is. Was changing six things easy or a little bit harder? Was it, was it harder because you used the same thinking? Yeah. No, oh, gosh, now I need six things. I don't have that many clothes. How will I keep myself nice? Mm. Okay, but we need to put our brains in a different space. Did anyone change their attitude? <laughs> yeah. We've done this with kids and they've switched. And so that when their partners turn around, everything has changed. See, we think in traditional ways. We go for the tangible stuff. And from a change perspective, we certainly know that it's the intangibles that make the ride through change easier, the way people feel, the vibe you create, the love in the room. Um, we've got to turn things up. So the very brain that trains us to be expert and gives us our little toolbox of techniques that we use is the very brain that we need to be challenging on an ongoing basis. We should be resetting our toolbox pretty frequently, finding new stuff, getting old stuff out, because I think we get caught in that very same routine. So even though we're the ones that are trying to inspire and engage, um, you know, sometimes I think we can get a little stale as well. So challenge, think a little differently, put your brain in a different space. Um, if you're not feeling uncomfortable, uh, you're probably not thinking big enough. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>